Hey y'all, welcome, welcome back to Interstage Window, my Saturday stream with my friends. And today, of course, as usual, is Landon is with me. Say hi, Landon. Hi, Landon. Oh my, oh my gosh. gosh. I've missed a show on the internet. I feel like it's been so long. I feel like it's been so long too. I really do. It's been insane. Everything that's been going on, we've had to like rearrange things. Um, but we are finally here to talk about Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince, right? That's our topic today? It is our topic, which is my favorite book. So we're going to have some hot takes and some fun opinions uh, and probably a rant about Draco Malfoy. But <laughs> <laughs> so I wouldn't do that too much. <laughs> we'll, we'll see. We'll see, right? So what I'd like to say first is um, welcome in Koneko. Oh my gosh, Koneko getting the first on a Saturday. I can't believe it. What is, what is happening? Um, but thank you so much for joining us today. And um, and I will say also, just like we did for the last Harry Potter book, because as the books go on, there's kind of like more in them to discuss, aka complain about. Um, <laughs> we, uh, we're breaking this into two parts. So today, this is kind of like, um, I guess we could say the, the Landon episode of Half-Blood Prince. And then next week, we're going to do the Karen episode of Half-Blood Prince. Would you say that's pretty accurate, Landon? <laughs> kind of. <laughs> I don't know. I have some complaints about this book, too. It sucks in some ways. But also, I think that there are some things that it does right, and we want to pay attention to that. So mm -hmm. uh, we'll talk about that first. And then next week, we'll just rip it to shreds. Yeah, we're going to talk about all the things that we really um, that we really dislike and the ways that we think that this book pulls the uh, the series into an ultimately negative direction that that uh, that turns into the, the final book it being what it is. <laughs> um, yeah. So so that being said, I would love to let's go ahead and get started. So I'm going to switch over so you guys can see our beautiful presentation that Landon worked so hard on. Here we go. Ooh, Harry Potter and the Half Blood Prince. <laughs> Six yes, book. This is the six six of seven. So um, book six yeah. of seven is Half Blood Prince, and um, that's what we're going to start with talking about today. But first, as we do every time we do a media episode, we want to tell you that here at Enter Stage Window, we will be talking about spoilers for the Harry Potter series, the entire thing, even though we're focusing on the sixth book, including the extended works of the Wizarding World. Uh, so if you're going to be angry about Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them spoilers or they might come up. So like, if you don't like it, close your ears, go read a book or just deal with it. Yeah, <laughs> this is not a spoiler free podcast stream. It never has been. It never will be. We don't believe that spoilers ruin something. If spoilers ruin something for you, then it wasn't that good to begin with. True. So. Also, like, I don't think we could not be spoiler free at this point. It's been 20 years, people. <laughs> I know, right? Especially for Harry Potter. <laughs> Um, also, within this, there there won't be too much discussion, but there might be discussion of uh, of topics that involve past and continual abuse, as well as many of the problematic views that J.K.R. brings up in her books. Mm -hmm. So just be a warning that nothing is off the table. We're going to talk about as long as with within Twitch guidelines and won't shut us down. That's right. <laughs> All uh, right. And... and Lastly, we have one more little announcement in regards to um, the Harry Potter universe. We do not support J.K. Rowling. Okay, J.K. Rowling is a turf. She's a turf. She's a big old turf. She's the biggest turf in the whole wide world. Um, so we we don't like it what she says on Twitter. We don't like her views, and um, we have in past episodes. Uh, started to look into how her trans misogyny has affected the series as a whole. I don't think that will come up this time. But because of that, you do not need to give us any money today. If you would like to subscribe or you would like to donate bits or things like that, if you are able, we would love if you could instead support the Trevor Project. So um, that is our preferred charity in regards to supporting our LGBTQ. I, A, I think I got all the letters, the League of Letters, and supporting the League of Letters. Um, as alphabet that's, mafia people. <clears throat> yes. <laughs> the alphabet kids of the world. We recommend that you do that instead, um, or um, in addition to uh, supporting I also, us. I also want to say that it is Pride Month, so if you are watching this, please buy your local queer an iced coffee. Um, they need it right now, so just be sure to do that. <laughs> 
and also donate to the Trevor Project because it's an amazing organization. Uh, and there's a fun fundraiser happening during Pride Month. So there sure. is. Yes. Okay. And happy Pride, of course. <laughs> All right. Let's get into it. So, as we do, let's talk about some of our favorite things. Mm. Karen, what is your favorite thing of Harry Potter and the Half Blood Prince? Okay. So, one of my favorite things in the Harry Potter universe is the ineffable, amazing Bill Weasley. I love him. You guys know I have a strong affinity for werewolf things. And um, I love all the werewolves in Harry Potter, as problematic as they are. Um, you know, I do think that uh, that Remus Lupin and Fenrir Greyback are quite, quite problematic. Um, love them. But what I really love is Bill Weasley in regards to the way that the werewolves are portrayed in Harry Potter. Because he comes into this whole werewolf thing very accidentally as an adult. And there is this threat upon Bill that this is going to um, change his life forever. That because he now has this thing he can't control and these things about his personality that he cannot undo. That that's going to mean the life that he had started to build is going to fall apart. But you know what? No, it doesn't. And he still gets everything that he wants. He just has to adapt to this new reality of his new wolfishness. And that is why Bill Weasley is the best Weasley. I will not be taking any comments or questions on that. It's just true. (laughs) You're right. (laughs) Best, hottest, most successful, truly, Mm -hmm. truly the pinnacle of Weasley success. It's true. Um, It's true. I also, the thing about Bill Weasley, and I, this is just a very quick aside, I also love that, A, the portrayal of what, of li- what, like, lycanthropy, like, lycanthropy light has on him, but also how they've, like, how it's written and how fandom has expanded it. Uh, because we get, like, a little bit of hint as far as, like, Bill likes his steak more rare than he used to, uh, but fandom definitely kind of grew what that could be a little bit beyond. And I appreciate that. How many minutes are we in? How many minutes are we in? Okay. I think we're far enough in Bill Weasley knots. Okay. That's all. That's all we're <laughs> yes. trying to say here. <laughs> he does. He does not. Mm-hmm. Um, and Fleur loves it because she's a Vila and she was made for breeding. That's all. That's all you <laughs> say. Uh <laughs> But oh boy oh boy oh we're gonna boy. have a shipping episode guys and it's gonna be great <laughs> mm-hmm. we're gonna talk about the harry potter ships um for our fandom episode in a few weeks we'll we'll tease more of that towards the end of this about when that's gonna happen but yes um love bill love bill and fleur um they're great they're fabulous uh you know all of that amazing love them yes um so so that is my favorite thing because um, Bill gets much more fleshed out towards the end of the books. So you really start to see that in this book and we get it more in the next book too. So that's why I chose him as my favorite thing. But Landon, what is your favorite thing? Well, since you asked, <laughs> I really love the concept of Amortia or love potions in general used within the Harry Potter world. This is where we really see them for the first time. Uh, And we see them on three different like levels and we'll talk about it a little bit, but we see like non-consent love poisoning from like uh, Voldemort. And that's how it was conceived to Romilda Vane, you know, trying to get to Harry and then Ron accidentally doing it. And then we also see them make it, it. uh in potions class and just Mm -hmm. the whole concepts of the different levels of love potions and the ideas and it's just perfect like it's a perfect wizarding thing to really key into the YA tropey love mess of teenagers uh that hadn't been explored and I really think like JKR embracing it this book really actually does make it feel like all the characters are teenagers <laughs> uh, and and that they're all at school and that it's a fucking mess <laughs> uh, and I and I love that I personally think it's fantastic yeah love potions is one of those things that's like it starts out and you're like this is kind of problematic if you expand on it and then the books actually expand on it and it's super problematic and it was one of the few yeah. times where i feel like the harry potter universe takes the understands the implications of what 
is in it and you actually see those implications as far as you would expect to see them um, for the age level that these books are supposed to be for. So it's kind of like, hey, good job, little, little pat on the back, you know, for the writing, um, the way that the love potions are are portrayed in this uh, in this book in particular. Yeah, whoever's editor came up with that, mm-hmm. fantastic, mm-hmm. because it wasn't JKR. <laughs> <laughs> we have no idea, of course, but we like to pretend since we dislike her so much. Um, but yeah, I mean, I love I love the implication that like kids are just out there just using love potions on each other. And it actually like is very upsetting. Um, yeah. And I think Fred and George, they sell them like they sell a yes. super low level one of like crushy feelings or whatever. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I'm just like, wow, this is. And then, of course, as a sixth year in school, you have you have to pass making this potion as like a standard or a grade in your final potions grade so every single person in theory that has taken sixth year potions knows how to make this incredibly dangerous love potion that means vast majority of the wizarding world knows how to make it basically yeah. because like, um you know unless it, like unless you don't i guess if you stop at your fifth year of potions you you wouldn't necessarily but the way that it's portrayed in the books is that potions is one of those um those classes that most people are would be expected to you know continue on in their sixth year yeah. and potentially their seventh so it's just like knowing that every single wizard we see has the knowledge of how to make somebody fall in love with them and then like force them to be in a relationship is just fascinating yes um Um, it's and it's funny it's funny because it's actually and this is what makes i think love potions so uh so cool in the wizarding world and, and kind of like how it's portrayed in the in the books is that like that's true in real life too like everyone knows how to put a roofie in a drink it's not like a secret You know, it's not a secret. It's whether you choose to uh, take advantage of another person or not. Right. Yes. I have a train coming. So I'm going to put myself on mute. Sorry. Oh, boy. That sounded like a really loud train. Um, We love trains, but Landon lives very close to one. And we've been lucky all this time to uh, not have a train interrupt us in the middle of the stream. But um, I guess it was it was eventual. (laughs) It was eventual that it was going to happen. Right. (laughs) At some point. But yeah, I was like, oh, that's it's blowing its horn. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. And Um, then the one other thing I want to say about love, though, I want to say about love potions is of course this is further expanded on because in this book we learn of um, Tom Riddle's backstory right when he was a kid and we learned that the whole reason that he was conceived and really what makes him different from Harry from the beginning is that um, his conception happened under the guise of a love potion where uh, and we know that love is a very powerful magical force so the fact that there was this false magical love that resulted in tom riddle being born uh kind of sets him up for failure so a very a very like a little parallel yeah. there a little a little literary device we're gonna we're gonna dive we're gonna wear that metaphor like a skin suit later in mm-hmm. this episode <laughs> mm-hmm. but first i feel that our audience deserves to know what the heck is going on. Right? So if it's so, been a long time since you have read Half-Blood Prince, or if you don't care about spoilers and you're just here to hang out with us, um, Landon now is going to summarize for you guys the actual events of Half-Blood Prince so we can all remember what goes on in this book. This is exactly how it happens, and no opinion is included at all. <laughs> the scene settles on a decrepit home of Severus Snape as he makes an unbreakable vow to complete whatever mysterious job that has been assigned to Draco Malfoy upon the insistence of Narcissa Malfoy. We see for the first time the true game that Sirius Snape, that Sirius, oh my God, Severus Snape is playing. But across London, at the same time, Dumbledore is picking up Harry from his home and takes him on the first of many side quests of this year to hire a retired potions teacher, Slughorn. Only then to drop Harry off at the Burrow for the summer. Us readers, a little bit overwhelmed about what's going on at that point. While out in Diagon Alley, the trio, Harry, Ron, and Hermione, run into Draco Malfoy and thus starts Harry's obsession of trying to figure out what is just happening or what is happening with his blonde-haired boyfriend, I mean, nemesis. (laughs) As they return to school, Harry becomes a, a... 
in possession of a potions book with hints written in the margins that once belonged to someone who deemed themselves the half-blood prince. These useful tricks and spells really set Harry ahead of the curve, winning him a boon of the bottle of luck, which is perfect because he needs to defeat Voldemort, protect Hogwarts, and most satisfying reason mentioned canonically is that Draco Malfoy wanted the potion and Harry was the one to get it instead. As Dumby and Harry's side quests continue, Harry learns about the twisted past of Tom Riddle Jr., how he was conceived in a loveless marriage, abandoned as a child, grown up odd in a world in which he did not fit. And at some point, the reader starts wondering if Tom and Harry are just the same person and how far J.K.R. will be willing to reach to make this metaphor about love work. They then learn how Tom... Uh, they then learn that Tom goes to school and is talented, loved among many of the staff, all but Dumbledore, and finally learn how he asks Slughorn how to make a horcrux. At which point the memory is altered and Harry must find a way to convince the drunken old man to be accountable for his actions and hand over the memory. They discover that Voldemort has split his soul or has the intentions to split his soul into seven pieces and that the items that they had been collected throughout the memories were the items that now housed them and now finally a path forward seems clear and laid out but things are more complicated than ever ron and hermione aren't talking ron has a girlfriend who calls him Wan Wan. a monster is growing inside of harry's chest whenever Ginny weasley is around it's making him very uncomfortable harry is quidditch captain and the half-blood prince is actually an is actually evil and makes evil spells and uh someone is trying to dose him with love potion and god damn it draco malfoy is up to something all the worries of a 17 year old boy are consuming harry's life and he doesn't have time to save the world but it all comes together as dumbledore tracks down the location of the, one of the horcruxes he and harry travel together to face down in furry and a potion that severely weak, weakens dumbledore only to return to this school and discover that it has been taken over that the thing that draco malfoy was up to was letting death eaters into the castle and killing dumbledore harry has to watch as his nemesis grapples with trying to complete his task but not before Severus Snape rushes in, and in the biggest twist of YA history, Snape raises his wand, ignores Dumbledore's begging, and kills the old man himself. In the battle as they escape, Harry chases down Snape, only for it to be relieved that all along Snape was the half-blood prince. The castle is left on fire as the crowd gathers around Dumbledore's body. Harry gas grasping Voldemort's horcrux in his hand, only to realize that it is a fake. This tragedy was all for nothing, and the war rages on, and they are losing. Dun, 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 dun. Dun. Do you remember when this book came out, and everyone wanted to spoil it for everyone else, oh and it was God. like the biggest freaking thing and like you could not you like you had to finish reading that book before you went on the internet before you went to school yeah. before you went to work because someone was gonna tell you guess what snape kills number door and it was just it was just like that it was just like that so it was a little different for me because i was a little bit younger and also i read books very quickly <laughs> so <laughs> i was the person who finished all of the book and had to sit there with my like hands over my mouth being like I need to talk to someone about this <laughs> um and all of my friends who are reading books at a perfectly normal speed for middle school were all just like what are you on and I'm like no one understands the pain I'm in right now <laughs> <laughs> oh my god if you want to kill it hear us um talk more about snape kills dumbledore tune in next week when we get to part two of this we're gonna have a whole section talking about that but um just hearing it again even though i just finished reading the book rereading the book it was still kind of like Ugh. no it was just truly and i think the thing is, is that we were all shook we were all mm -hmm. shook even in the first chapter though we find out that snape is on is on the Death Eater side, and we're all like, what the fuck? But we're like, don't believe it, because Snape is, Snape is, or Dumbledore is so convinced that Snape is on his side. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. he's not. 
Mm-hmm. And then, and then everything Harry has been feeling, like all of a sudden, I think for the first time, Harry, we as the readers sit there and go, God, Harry was right about everything in this book. He was right about like Snape. He was right about being paranoid. He was right about his instincts with Tom Riddle. He was right about Dra- Draco Malfoy. Everything Harry has done is right in this book. And even we as the readers, because we're just coming off of the heels of the fifth book where Harry was useless, are like, Harry doesn't know anything. He knew something. <laughs> Indeed, he did. This book did a lot for the Snape fandom, I must say, as somebody who was in the Snape fandom at the time. Um, this this book rocked it. <laughs> so yeah. I know. So, OK, so to get to kind of like get started on this discussion, we complain a lot about Harry Potter. So we decided this time we're going to start with the things about this book that are good, you guys. And we're going to kind of like we're going to start with the good and we're going to kind of gear up to the things that um, bother us about this book. So the first good thing we would like to talk about is Tom Riddle. So we get Tom Riddle's full backstory in this book. So as Landon explained to us, Tom Riddle, um, basically, he is a lot like Harry in the sense that he was an orphan. But instead of his parents truly loving him, for Tom, it was this obsession that his mother had with his father that resulted in him. There was no real love there. There was an, in fact, a one-way infatuation, right? A one-way infatuation. And, um, and there was a lot of abuse there, um, that, uh, that came directly from his parents, as opposed to for Harry, the abuse in his life was suffered through his aunt and uncle, not through his parents. So a little bit, a little bit different there. And, um, and we just really like this part of the book. Right, yeah. Landon? We like it. <laughs> it, 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 give, it gives... At this point, Voldemort has been the boogeyman underneath the bed. That he's unstoppable, untouchable, dark harness power, evil lord, blah, 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 right? This actually gives depth into his character. It gives us an understanding of, oh, hey, he wasn't just born the evil dark lord, although there's he was born evil basically but he wasn't born this monstrosity of a person this is how he got there uh and it is it is fascinating i think there's a lot to be said about the uh i think there's a lot to infer from what jk rowling thinks makes evil people Mm -hmm. um like the idea of like his mother trapped his father in a loveless marriage and forced and was and had a baby and then gave that baby up and then that baby was raised you know in an orphanage and so therefore that person must be evil and also the root of that is the fact that 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 something he couldn't control was what made him evil the fact of how he was conceived was what made him a terrible person yeah it's kind of got this this dual nature right because it's impossible to look at tom riddle and not see the clear parallels between his life and Harry's life where they both spent their childhood severely abused. Tom was severely abused by the system that he was in. He really didn't experience anything that um, in his life that, that wasn't abuse until he gets to Hogwarts. Like we're never shown that he made a friend at the orphanage or anything like that. And Harry's Mm -hmm. childhood is much the same. Like when he's living with the Dursleys, we are never explained that Harry had any friends at school. It's explained to us that he was abused at home and that Dudley made sure that he was abused at school as well. And then he never experiences anything that's not abuse until he goes to Hogwarts, just like Tom. And so we're meant to infer from that, that um, it was, it's, it's choice, right? And I think that's ultimately what we find here is like, you can be set up in a, in a same way and make different choices. Um, we've, and we've got kind of that problematic backing of what they were born with as far as, you know, the way that Tom was conceived versus the way that Harry was conceived. But ultimately, we don't have choice in the way that we are born into this world, but we do have choices afterwards. And Tom has a pivotal moment where he is allowed to make a different choice in the way that he treats his teachers and the way that he treats his peers. And he chooses not to. 
And the way that this comes off is just this kind of like this very like tropey and we love a good trope, right? It's this very tropey, like, uh, you know, love is the ultimate magic. Your choices actually matter because Harry wrestles with this in the book. He sees Tom's backstory and he's like, that is really dang close to mine. What happened here? Um, and he really wrestles with that in a way that I think is not only realistic, but um, but valid for somebody his age to think about it. Yeah, no, I think that that I, I think it also helps the reader connect the two as well. And mm-hmm. we'll be talking about that later. The stream as, as well. But how Harry, we have been told Harry and Tom have this connection purely by the fact that hit you know Tom uh, Voldemort tried to kill him as a baby and then uh we know the prophecy exists and mm-hmm. we know that there are other connections that are existing but this is like the real first time that it's like oh no there is a human connection here that Harry chose differently Harry had it different but from the very beginning Harry was bullied and Tom was the bully mm-hmm. um and and uh yeah, I think that that's cool. I also love a good written villain. And we get to see, not Voldemort, because Voldemort is like the tropey evil person, but we get to see Tom Riddle. We get to see him be magnanimous and charming and sly. And we get to see him understand the inner workings of people's minds and thoughts. And really, this story leads us to understanding how he truly could have gotten the power that he got because how he is now is a half you know barely human half snake sort of man who is more feared than loved like that is not how dictators start out they can't (laughs) start out that way because no one would sell into that cult uh no one would buy in people would buy into the very handsome charming person who would make all the promises in the world and then have to double down from there um and so it's just really interesting that we were able to see that yeah no jed we know we had some trouble with landon's connections today oh, sure. um it, when, whenever you get loud your mic is like really freaking out <laughs> it's the it's but it's the same as like your camera was freaking out today um yep <laughs> Sorry for that. Um, it's Sorry. okay. I've got you. I've got you turned down in the OBS so that it's not too crazy. <clears throat> I can turn my mic down too. Okay. Um, yeah, for sure. I think that reading Harry Potter and kind of growing up with Harry Potter, the way that Tom Riddle is presented really set me up anyway to expect for like. Um, villains to always have a backstory and you kind of know why they are the way they are. I do think that there is something to be said for villains just being evil, right? But I feel like that's so not real life, right? Like you think about how everybody in reality that does terrible, horrible things doesn't do them for shits and giggles, right? Like they do them because they're trying their best to survive within the systems that they are presented with in their life, right? And so we see Tom Riddle and it's kind of like, huh, I get it. And Harry, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, can I get a little writing nerd? Like I have a little writing media nerd thing to have to do. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, Um, I was just saying, yeah. like, Tom Tom Riddle basically set me up as far as, like, I always want to know the villain's backstory now. And if there isn't one, I'll go find some fanfic for it. <laughs> and that's because of how we consume media, media generationally, uh, especially, like, here in the United States where we create a lot of media. A lot of the media we create reflects the generational outlook on how like our society is. And so in the, this is just, sorry, I just studied this in school, but in in the like the 1950s, 1940s, uh, coming off hot off the presses of of World War II and then into the Korean and Vietnam Wars, um, we really, really did want to feel like we were fighting against an unknown evil and that evil could not be questioned at any point in time. So that's when the rise of things like comic books and superheroes and all of that started really getting popular um, because it was like, we just want to fight this as a society, this unknown evil. 
Mm -hmm. Um, and we just want to, we, we don't want to care about what the other side is doing because we as a society right now don't care about the other perspective. We just need to protect our own. And so all of our protagonists from that age, all of the main characters and stories and medias really only showed that, like, that faceless villain that we don't give two shits about. Um, and as media has expanded since then uh, and continues to grow and the world has become more complicated and we have entered societal choices and wars that have become more complicated, our media and newscasting has, like, has started relaying more perspective on things uh we now want to consume things that have multi-dimensional purpose so that's like you can see in the transformation of superheroes how we went from like comic books and not caring what the villain was to like the avengers that we have these days mm -hmm. um and the the marvel cinematic universe which makes us question not only our heroes but also our villains uh and and that is uh Landon you're slowing you're slowing down again to grow so I Harry Potter and really hey guys um yeah can we can we just really sorry Landon can you hear me Landon I can okay we're just gonna take a brief intermission guys um we will be right back I'm just gonna flip back to the starting soon screen for a second Hey guys, so sorry about that. We are back now with a rebooted computer, so hopefully that fixes everything. Um, if you weren't here live, you missed some rowdiness in the chat. You'll have to come to the live shows if you want to see that, because I I just cu I'm cutting it all out of the vod. So YouTube people, this was like an instant for you. <laughs> um, my takes are just so spicy, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, whenever I get passionate, apparently I just cause uh, technology to fail. <laughs> but she sounds much better now, right guys? So that was the right thing to do. Okay, so so let's continue. Let's continue. So we love the Tom Riddle backstory. What uh, what else do we love about this particular book? We also, or at least I also, love the YA tropes and the dictating of what is a YA novel. Like we said, it certainly didn't create the genre but it built the genre uh and it really just this book encapsulates messy love triangles it encapsulates just like not communicating your feelings and it just it's a cw show in a book and it's fantastic uh and and it really does like kind of make it explode of oh you can have complicated romantic relationships in novels who knew Mm -hmm. <laughs> not that that didn't happen in novels before, no, but Harry Potter had such a huge impact on YA that you still see its effects like in several other YA books, like the idea of, of putting everybody into a category, right? And it's just, it makes things very fun to play with. Like I am a, a personality test whore, okay? I love them. As you guys know, we do little personality tests at the beginning of the Thursday streams because they're super fun, right? So I want to know what category I'm in. Um, and uh, and there are ways that the Harry Potter world and then other category type books um, are incredibly problematic and don't really handle it correctly. But I still like to proudly say, like, I identify with Ravenclaw, right? And um, and I know Landon still likes to say that she proudly identifies with uh, with Slytherin. So, yes. like, yep. the the groupings, um, the love triangles, the um, all all of that, like, you just see ripples of it. You see ripples of it for like the next. Gosh, I feel like you even see it still today in a lot of ways. <laughs> Certainly among the millennial generation, people still widely connect to this story. Um, but yeah, I think that also within it kind of it's kind of like that thing where if you if it's if you're going on a path and people are just gonna continue to follow the path. And when one person steps off the path, they're like you're like, oh, I have a whole world around me that mm -hmm. I can walk in. And it really was in a way, some of these tropes stepping off the path and other people then going further with them mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. and, and being able to explore more of the land. Uh, and that's that's really what it kind of led to. And it certainly wasn't the first to ever do this. I mean, YA at this point had started popping off already, um, but it, it, it definitely expanded so much of what was possible 
and it made it fun to read. The fifth mm-hmm. book was miserable to read. I love that there are certain things I love about the fifth book. If you want to go see our, our talk about that, please do. But this book, genuinely, there were I was, times where I was laughing or times where I was like, yeah, Harry, what's that monster in your chest? What could it ever be? It smells like flowers. Like, why are you, why do you like that sort of thing? Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> when, it, when it comes to the tropes in this book, I will say that I do like this book much better than the fifth book. I had a lot of negative things to say about the fifth book, and I have a lot of negative things to say about this book, too. But this book at least has moments that I like. <laughs> I'm I'm not I'm not like um bored and lost and frustrated completely in this book, right? Absolutely. All right. Yep. And there's one more thing that we like about this book. Jesus Christ, her action scenes are so good. <laughs> so right? we have said this we've said this before so many times like when it comes to where JK Rowling's prose is actually like excellent like what the things we think she should lean into it's the action scenes okay the quidditch matches amazing the um the fire scene like i know that that's quite different in the book versus the movie right um and 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 the i've got some movie screenshots here because the way that the movie translates these scenes is just like oh my god like when we have harry and dumbledore go into that cave so that they can get that that horcrux and dumbledore has to drink the the potion that makes him you know want to die or whatever um like psychologically tortures him and then all those things come out of the water it's just like uh, i mean it's just it's just so good the action scenes are so good in I, this book it makes it honestly makes me feel like someone sat JKR down and is like, this is what you're really good at. You're really good at world building. You're really good at action scenes. And you got some funny singers in there. Let's build a book around that. Mm -hmm. Uh, And and it really did. Yes, because all of these moments of high intensity were intense. They kept you focused. I mean, there are times like with the Inferi, I was as scared with the Inferi and the scene with Dumbledore and like Harry having to force Dumbledore to drink a potion that he was begging him to stop drinking and and like having to go on and all that whole journey. I was on the edge of my seat as much as I was in the fourth book with the with the Death Eaters uh, and the Graveyard. Yes, like that's how I feel too. Feeling, um, and I know that the movie kind of fucked up the Bellatrix, the the like the battle at Hogwarts because they didn't want to have a big battle in Hogwarts um, because they knew that there was going to be one for the finale or for the final book. So they didn't want to like double take that. But in that whole thing where there's spells flying and the order is showing up and students are, are chaos and, and the death eaters are trying to escape and Bellatrix is lighting Hagrid's house on fire and things like that. All of that is happening. And it's so chaotic and wild because it's really the first time we read war zone writing within this novel or within yeah. the series in general mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yes um Kendra I, I hear your take Harry got good in this book yes I agree as y'all know I am a Harry hater when it comes to Harry Potter he is my least favorite character for the most part I dislike him um I don't like his the way that he thinks about things or narrates things and I don't have, find him particularly compelling or interesting but if I think okay. about each of the books and my feelings towards him as a character, he's the best in this book. Like even me as a Harry hater can recognize that he's the best written in this book. Um, the way that he processes things in regards to how he handles like um, his his intuition about what's going on with Draco, the way that he talks about uh, the different horrors that he faces, like what happened, what ends up happening to Katie Bell in this book, like. The way that he narrates it is excellent in this book. It's so much better. Like, and I know that like you couldn't write this Harry as 11 year old Harry, but in a way I feel like, my gosh, I wish that we had this Harry in some of the other books because I don't hate him as much. He's just a little annoying. So in my, and I argue a little bit that we do get glimpses of this Harry. I think that this Harry is very close to the fourth year Harry. I think the thing is, is that we have book five, which drags us down so much Mm -hmm. that it feels disconnected. It's like, oh, we started loving this character and then he sucked so bad. And I guess what it really means is 
book five should have had more action scenes. Like, really, yes. that's what it should have been. That would have or, made us not hate Harry so much in the fifth book. Or he should have, or he should have bought in halfway through, or whatever. Like, like because that's the other thing too is that a lot of this is Harry getting his power back. Mm-hmm. He's making actions, whereas the entire fifth book he didn't. Things happened to him, and in this book, he's doing things. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so then the results are in this book we have all these amazing, amazing action scenes again mm-hmm. that we were missing last book that made the last book with book five so boring and then we're reading this book and it's like you know stuff is happening and harry's engaging and he's actually at these scenes experiencing them and he's able to tell us from his perspective what's going on and it's like yeah 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 you know and we find ourselves rooting for him again because again jk rowling's best writing is her action scenes just objectively it is like if she if she would just lay off being so interested in writing like mysteries and she would just instead write like mindless action books like i feel like she would have actually been able to capture an audience for her adult writing that she she's doing so much nowadays um but uh, because she keeps writing these mysteries that nobody likes she just continues to remain like nobody cares like if it's not harry potter nobody cares right um regardless of how they feel about her uh, her awful awful political opinions um even the people that, that are on her side in regards to that, they don't really seem to like her books. But I think they would if she would just write mindless action because she's so good at it. But she, yeah. But, but she I won't. Mean, probably a, she won't. It's a whole thing. Yeah. Um, and, but no, this book is full of them. Um, this book is full of it. It's full of, of fun character moments. It's full of things that feel real, of fun tropes, and of fun, intense yeah. action scenes. Uh, and that's really where it makes this book shine. Yeah. Yeah, so it's like this book. This this book, um, as much as it, it frustrates me um, at a higher level, we'll talk about that next episode. It has a lot of redeeming qualities. It actually has sections where, like, you you just want to tear through it. It's and it's really good and engaging. Yep. And then there's one final thing that I think was really good. Something that we both really loved, and something that tied so much together that it really is a brilliant idea mm-hmm. and then oh it went too far hold on there we go there we go the horcruxes yes brilliant mm-hmm. truly brilliant in my mind um i i <laughs> It was it once once that twist was revealed of of figuring out like what the fuck that like all these items are about and what's actually happening to them. It was like, oh, this is really kind of a cool concept. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Holy moly. <laughs> yeah. Now, I don't I think that there there are criticisms of how this was executed. I definitely yes. don't think that this is something that JKR had planned from the beginning, as she has claimed a couple of times in interviews. That's not true. She definitely came up with this while she was writing the sixth book and then retroactively changed a few things to make it, you know, been a been a thing all along, which is fine, by the way. That's not a criticism. The criticism is that she won't admit that she does that just like every other writer does that anyways. Um, but I love this concept. And y'all know that have um, that have been around me for a while that the idea and the concept of a soul as something that can be moved around into different objects that can change from body to body is something that really intrigues me. Like, I love the concept of possession. Um, one of my favorite magical girl animes, Madoka Magica. As you guys know that have seen it, they take the souls of the girls and and they put them into gems. It's like a whole thing in that show. And uh, and I just I love that idea. And I really think it's because like when I read Harry Potter, I was so taken with the concept of Horcruxes. And I just thought I thought it was the coolest freaking thing. Like, oh, this is why. And so I just truly feel and I think this was the intention. I truly feel that Voldemort was redeemable like tom riddle was redeemable until he started breaking his soul into pieces and that's what set him on the path to where there was nothing he could do except become a powerful fascist right that once he started breaking his soul apart there was nothing he could do but become that but up until that moment i like to think that he was redeemable and there were things that he could have done to uh to not play out this particular fate for himself and for the wizarding world. Um, 
And I love how the Horcruxes expand the lore in Harry Potter um, because it lets us talk about all of these magical objects. Like, they're so cool, right? So like, okay, <laughs> this is a trope in fantasy, right? Magical objects. And it is something that we see that we see only a little bit in Harry Potter. And it's things that we have consistently loved along the way on these rereads, like the time turners and the invisibility cloak and things like that. And then all of a sudden in this book, she's like, here are four, here are six more. Here are six more that we're gonna give you. And they all mean something. And now you have to go hunt them. And I'm like, mm -hmm. wow, this is a DD &D campaign. That is what <laughs> happened. We fully, we fully bought into the fantasy of it. Let's go. I'm here mm -hmm. for it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. It totally is. It totally is. It turns it turns the seventh book um, that comes later into a D&D &D campaign. Now we'll get to the seventh book because I do think that um, there's execution in there that could have absolutely been done better. It's kind of like they set up this cool, it's JKR sets up this really cool thing with the Horcruxes and then she just kind of like, oh no, I've got too many Horcruxes. I'm just going to drop them all. <clears throat> so, but I just, I love the concept. I, I continue to this day to um, have interest in the idea of breaking your soul apart, um, of segmenting your soul, and um, and the idea that objects can have souls. And I really do think like Harry Potter, this book put that into me, and I have never been able to let it go. Never been able to let it go. Like a piece of soul living in a crown, what? You know, a piece of soul living inside of a snake. What? This is the true Nagini, by the way. We do not recognize the the changes they made to Nagini in Fantastic Beasts. This Nagini that holds part of Voldemort's soul. Coolest part about her. She doesn't need any more to her character. This is enough. Okay. Enough. Very cool. I also like, there's, yes, the idea of like breaking down a soul is incredibly cool. I also think that there is this idea of, of, asking the bigger question of what it means to be human mm -hmm. um which isn't which is one of the things that I wish was tackled a little bit more of like we see we supposedly see Voldemort prior to ruining his soul and taking it apart bit by bit and we see it after and the only things that have really changed are physical yep um and it I wish that there had been more there had been a little bit more like like, did, like, I wish that it had been things like that he loses his charm, that he isn't as charming as he was before, because he doesn't understand how to relate to humans, things like that. He lacked empathy to begin with, because he was a psychopath starting this, starting out. So like, it would have been cool if that was something that he had lost along the way, because he traded his soul. Like, there was no stakes in taking his soul apart, other than this terribly secret thing that you have to do in order to in order to create a horcrux mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, i think in in regards to taking the soul apart for for voldemort the consequence that we really see is his own hubris and stupidity right like voldemort's like what 70 something when he when he dies whereas we learn from other old wizards such as dumbledore and and other older characters in in the wizarding world at large that um wizards routinely live to like a hundred plus no problem and Tom Riddle probably would have too if he hadn't broken his soul apart. <laughs> but I'm going to argue something there. And I don't think like that taking his soul apart is what allows us to see that. I think, I also think hubris is incredibly, is, is a, a human trait only. Like mm. the idea of, of a man with power being hubris is about as stereotypically accurate as you can get <laughs> mm -hmm, right mm -hmm. like absolute power corrupts absolutely sort of thing yes um so i think that like yeah that's just the one area that i i would have loved to see expanded on and not really an area that can be controlled or changed within fanon so i've not seen a lot of experience with it being expanded upon but i do think that it has encouraged and made people curious because i do think after this book, people have started exploring the idea of souls within mm -hmm. YA tropes. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that had always been a question. Yes. But yes. And I yeah. do think that in regards to like what happened to Tom when he loses his soul and how it really doesn't change his personality or anything, what I have seen is I have seen like retroactive 
um, fanfic and things of that nature that kind of expand on his his childhood. And like maybe he did have a friend when he was a kid that actually liked him and got along with him. Or maybe he did have a girlfriend at one point that he wasn't just using that he actually did care for or things like that. And I feel like I've seen that in regards to um, some uh, Bellamort stuff that I have seen around in the fandom. So I think when it comes to Tom's personality changing, the only time I have I have seen it, because it's not present in canon, of course, the only time I have seen it is with um with Bellamort fans, which as you guys know, I'm not a huge fan of Bellamort. Not because of the Voldemort side of it, because of the Bella side of it is where I have an issue. But um <laughs> I'm but I'm more into Bella Dolphus for her, right? But yeah. um but yeah I do think I have seen the Bellamort fandom kind of like lean into adding a little bit more positivity to uh, Tom Riddle's history and childhood before he starts, you know, splitting his soul up. Yeah. Which I think, I mean, I think that would have been one of those interesting, I think that that would have been a little bit interesting because it's like hard to go from, Hey, we're starting, we're starting this character as evil because he is evil. He's torturing kittens and torturing and also torturing like other uh, children at school. Like that's the first time we meet him is that Mm -hmm. we're watching him after he's tortured other kids. And so it's like, okay, we're starting the plate is starting evil and it's really hard to go from evil to more evil yeah (laughs) Uh, if we start if we start the plate at like neutral then Mm -hmm. going from neutral to super evil is a fucking cool journey just like with harry going from neutral to good or super good is a cool journey is the journey that we've been watching Mm -hmm. um and so i think that that could have there's just the writer in me but obviously we can't we can't take away from that this concept in general is really fucking cool. Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince fix it fic where we add in a scene. The Dumbledore shows um, shows Harry inside the pensive some like positive memory of Tom <laughs> Riddle to help Harry understand that like, you know, um, it, it's OK. Like he had the capacity to be good, too, and he chose not to. And then um, and you can choose that. You can choose not to you as well. You are choosing that. And that's yeah. way more powerful. Anyway. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, yeah, the concept of Horcruxes, freaking love it. I, I love the Horcruxes in Harry Potter. I just think they they are one of the coolest um, magical items that we get among tons of other really cool magical items that we have in the series. So yeah, sweet. Um, and I will continue to uh, to steal the concept of Horcruxes and put them into my role plays and writings and things of that nature that yeah. uh, that I make. And I will forever question what it means to have a soul. So that's mm-hmm. how it's changed and affected me. <laughs> All right, Love it. ad break. Ad break. If my computer wants to go. But at least it's not messing with your microphone anymore. At least I sound crisp and clear. There we go. There we go. Want the ultimate YA novel? I mean, we're talking about Harry Potter. We're talking about how this is the pinnacle YA of the series. So I figured that I would tell you guys about a book that you should reread because you've probably read it if you are watching this. And this is the entirety of the Hunger Games series. I've had the pleasure to reread this fairly recently. And let me tell you that this was shameful how we as a fandom and as a media and as a society handled these books. Because I remember it was in the height of the shipping wars. We just came off of the heels of Twilight. We were trying to find the next big movie franchise and everyone was like, Team Peta or Team Gale, and that's not what the fucking book's about at all. But that's what we made it about. Uh, and so now I would like to challenge you, dear watcher, to go reread this series or listen to it on Audible uh, and find out how awesome this book series is without all of the bullshit that media is trying to shove down your throat. 
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you can go and download it today by starting your Audible trial at um, audibletrial.com slash interstage window. If you start it, you will get your first 30 days free. You will get two credits that you can use for the first two Hunger Games books. And um, and yeah, reading them or listening to them again in 2022, you wonder how the heck in heck we got so damn focused on Gale versus PETA because there is no contest in these books that just does not exist in there this is doesn't exist that we're trying to beat yes so yes. katniss could not care less about the romance between either herself and gail or herself and Peta. honestly like everyone else cares about it more than her and she is constantly talking about how much she does not care about this aspect of her life so, um, yeah, really great reread. None of us listened to Katniss, the protagonist of the book, trying to tell us that this was not the point. <laughs> he tried. Um, and also, like, there's something to be said about having an unlikable protagonist in a YA novel. Um, and I think that we all kind of hated that in 2012 when it was popular. But 10 years later, reading it, I'm like, actually... Katniss is a teenage girl and mm -hmm. I really appreciate the fact that nobody likes her and it feels real because she's not a likable character and that's the point mm -hmm. that's the point uh and we yep. missed that during the whole fun choose a boy segment of media <laughs> <laughs> we did we did but yeah go back and reread it in 2022 um we we slept on this hard in the wrong way and um and it was ahead of its time it was truly all right mm -hmm. back to the wizarding world of harry potter however so we've been hinting at it and i think we should di deep dive into this and that is mm -hmm. the idea of how children are treated in the harry potter universe but most importantly the relationship between harry and tom mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and how they are truly two sides of the same coin mm -hmm. uh and i feel like i know that we've talked about it in the um obviously throughout all of these streams about how Harry was raised and we talked about it in the summary how Tom was raised but I think really diving into the fact that Harry was born from a marriage of love um, and he was born from people who were fighting against Voldemort and his parents sacrificed their lives so left him behind to save him and then he was sent off to a place where he was raised unloved, uncared for, abused, treated badly, both at school and at home, only to then be, and only to feel like an outsider in the world that he lived in, only to then be informed that there is this world beyond that he fits into. Uh, and from there, he has made friends, has charmed professors, has gotten away with literal murder twice, <laughs> um, has had his life, his life put in danger, um, and has has found a home inside the wizarding world, and has also found himself with immense power and prestige uh, at a young age. Mm -hmm. Yep, and we see the same thing happening to Tom. We're shown this because. Tom joins the Slug Club, which uh, we we don't have a huge amount of plans to talk about Slughorn. Slughorn is a as a character that's been talked to talked about to death in the Harry Potter fandom um, because his unique uh, position as the best of the evil characters. <laughs> He's the best Slytherin we see, and he's still super problematic. Um, so we're not going to go too much into that, but he does get to Tom does get, get to join the Slug Club, which is seen as like all of the the quote unquote most talented students, according to Slughorn's, you know, um, idea of what that means, right? So Tom is and invited to that despite his like being an orphan and having no lineage or anything of that nature. So he's clearly a very talented wizard, right? And we know that his peers and his teachers think of him that way because we see how Slughorn treats him. And we we also hear it like throughout the book. It's it's mentioned that Dumbledore was the only person who really didn't know, didn't like trust him. We also know from experience that Tom, um, Tom was at fault for the Chamber of Secrets being mm -hmm. opened in his in his fifth year and Hagrid's I think uh, fifth year as well, and was able to trick 
people and professors and get away with, again, literal murder uh, by blaming it on Hagrid um, and that he had that prestige and that uh, power, even as a fifth year, to to really manipulate the adults around him Um, and that he didn't trust the adults around him, which is another thing that Harry has in common with him. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but um, neither of them have any reason to trust them to be fair no, no absolutely not the world has not made them and we also know that they both have the want to impress albus dumbledore um harry because he looks at dumbledore as a father figure and search- searches for dumbledore's approval because he has been raised and padlawed for lack of a better word to do just that and tom because he wants to feel like he has everyone under his control uh including Mm -hmm. dumbledore so again another connection that we're really seeing between these two characters um and in that they really are the two journeys that could be taken from these from the life of like an orphan abandoned in this magical world Mm -hmm. Uh, and that jakey rowling really wants us to see that contrast Mm -hmm. she wants she wants to see that like choice plays a huge role but Mm -hmm. i think there's another take that we could have as well and that that other take is that the terry is kind of dumbledore's redo in a way so dumbledore tries to cultivate tom to be this better person to overcome the hardship he's faced in his life and to use his abilities, because he's a very powerful wizard, to use his abilities for a positive effect on that world. So Dumbledore tries to sort of cultivate Tom and to to turn Tom into this, this positive force and to turn him into like his little soldier for good, right? And he fails. He fails so utterly and completely that instead he creates a fascist. Okay, so Dumbledore do, does does not do do what he was wanting to do in regards to the way that he mentored Tom. So yeah. Harry is sort of this redo for him, right? Where he gets to step into this mentor role of this wizard that is incredibly talented and also um, had a terrible life that needs to be pushed in the direction of good. And um, and uh, and he's successful this time. So. It, it, it is about Harry's versus Tom's choices, but it's also about Dumbledore growing as a mentor and learning how to make the kids do what he wants them to do. But Karen, you're missing a whole step in here. What's and the other that step? Is that before Tom, there was Grindelwald, mm. which we learn about the fact that Dumbledore and Grindelwald were in a relationship in their youth and Grindelwald uh they they bonded over blood supremacy they bonded over down with the muggles for the for the greater good all of these ideas and at the end of everything uh Grindel he Dumbledore could not turn Grindelwald good and Dumbledore gave him the tools to become a fascist that would take over the wizarding world and uh and really um spur on uh another wizarding world that predates Voldemort uh and that Dumbledore didn't have the power to stop him until he did so knowing that knowing that this is hot off hot off the presses in the timeline of Dumbledore's life, that Grindelwald has just been put away when Tom Riddle comes into his life and he sees Tom as a very similar to Grindelwald, charming, powerful, uh, could be uh, incredibly dangerous and so needs to show him the good and the light and then once again fails. But you know what? You know what I think Dumbledore learns from that? It's a lot easier to manipulate kids than it is to manipulate your lover. I think that's what he learns from that. (laughs) I definitely think that's what he learns from that. I also think that he definitely learns it's a lot easier to manipulate someone the younger they are. And so all of a sudden, many years later, he's given a baby. He's given a baby in which that he can make sure to raise the way that he wants it. And how does he choose to do that? He chooses to put it in the hands of the people that are going to hurt him the most. 
so that when he comes to Hogwarts, Dumbledore will be able to sweep in and that boy at that age can do nothing but hero worship him. It's true. Mm -hmm. And that is the character J.K. Rowling created, whether she'll admit it or not. (laughs) That's the pattern. That's the path right there. You go from failed failed manipulation and failed wanting to find someone good that person becomes a fascist to it happening again except younger and that person becomes a fascist to finally having harry and being like hmm, other than me not being involved in this how could we change the formula (laughs) (laughs) yes and i think and i think that um that the way that when when we look at Harry versus Tom, it really does come back to that power of love concept, right? Because the one thing that's really different about Harry versus these other characters is the love. Oh, thank you. Look what I got, you guys. I got some watermelons. Watermelons? For summer. Yeah, so I'm going to have some watermelons. Thank you. Um, so, so yeah, you know, when it comes, when it comes to Harry, like it is about his choices, but he's, I feel like the way that the narrative is set up, he's given the ability to make those different choices because of Lily's true love sacrifice. And I think what we're really intended to, to come to from the Harry Potter universe is that while there are all of these things that are manipulating us, right, that, um, that if you just have love it's all going to work out, which we can debate whether that's true or not. But that really is the difference that we see is that Harry, once he gets out of that situation, he instantly has love, right? He sits with Ron and, um, and he has a lot of love coming from the Weasleys and from Molly in particular, right? Like he gets, he gets a mom here essentially, um, because he doesn't have his own mom. She passed away. He has friends instantly. Um, even though he is incredibly annoying, people in general are um, are pretty nice to him, right? He really doesn't come yeah. into a lot of uh, of bullying at Hogwarts, and neither does he take part in a huge amount, other than the rivalry between himself and Draco, of course. <laughs> That's just foreplay. What? Um, <laughs> no, it's it's very true that uh, once. I, I think and I think that that's the difference too is that Tom grew up not needing it he was more powerful than all of the children he could control the staff around him Harry had no control in his growing up he he was the victim whereas Tom was the bully and so all of a sudden being in a situation where he didn't need power he just needed love whereas Tom went through and was like okay now I have more people I need to figure out how to manipulate mm-hmm it's an important Mm -hmm. it's an important thing Mm -hmm, for sure and it's just very interesting in a series that focuses on kids that um the way that the children are treated in the harry potter universe that they don't have more agency than they already have like they do have agency and it does culminate in this battle of uh, of hogwarts that happens in the seventh book where all the kids really do like literally save the world in a way by taking part in this battle but um If you think about up until that point, the children really don't have agency. And um, and this sort of continues to be the case in the in the Harry Potter universe, um, very much like it is in our world, which really speaks to the way that um, the Harry Potter wizarding world like stories Ultimately, it's about upholding the status quo. The best thing that you can do in the Harry Potter world, no, everything, every book, every movie is uphold the status quo. That is what you are supposed to do. That is what is rewarded in this universe. That is what um, all of our protagonists continue to do. Major change is bad. All you should do is make changes to return to the status quo. And uh, so these characters, both Tom, Harry, and really all of the other kids don't have much agency in the Harry Potter universe. They really don't get to do what they want to do, no matter what that is. They get manipulated, they yeah. get pushed, whatever. They And there is there is a level of understanding that this is a YA novel and you want your protagonists and the people that the protagonist surrounds themselves in or the peers to feel powerless so there can be a power grabbing trope 
right? Like that is because that's very common. A lot of teenagers feel powerless. That is the demographic that you're going for. You really want them to relate to your protagonist. So that is a huge trope that exists. However, if you look at all the situations that JKR has put the children in, there it, it's different because there is no point in time where they do have agency to grab power. Again, it is back to that status quo sort of idea that even though like Ron always feels powerless in his life, being the youngest brother of seven sons or whatever, our six sons, um, and never really achieving his own thing, never going above and beyond. He constantly feels powerless and continues to do. There's never a point in time where Ron is just like, yeah, let me grab my power and redefine that. That The cycle is never complete, which makes it feel unsatisfying, which highlights the treatment of all these children. Yes, yes. It's not like they come back at the end after the battle and all of a sudden they're given this level, this new level of agency. It's just like everything returns to to normal, right? Yeah. The well, quote like unquote if, way it's supposed to be. And I know that this is the seventh book and we'll get, I, the epilogue is going to be its own episode on its own. Oh my um, God. <laughs> but, but the idea that Ron, like, and I'm, I'm focusing on Ron because Ron is supposedly the happiest character, the less tra- traumatized character in all of, like, all of the book. Um you have a boy who consistently feels second best, consistently feels that he is not as good as Harry, as his brothers, all of these things. And his cycle, his overall plot ends him in working for the oars where he is behind Harry and takes orders from Harry to quitting to working in the joke shop that his brother owns. So then even then he's still second in command and it's like never this point of, Oh, let me take that power. Hermione yeah. is very similar. Hermione is very similar. Uh, even though she does grow in power and eventually becomes minister of magic uh, her, but that's not her arc. Her arc isn't success in the future. Her arc is supposedly like learning emotional and hu- and I'm like, I don't even know what Hermione's arc is at times. I'm like, mm-hmm. what is the point of her? Um, of, of, of learning emotionality and even then she's choosing logic over everybody else <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and to go back to Ron for a second I think this book really solidifies that that's what's eventually going to happen to his character and he really can't move past that because we have him in um the Quidditch match where the reason why he does so well is because he believes that his drink was spiked with the luck potion and it wasn't, of course, um, but he believes that. And so it shows that like he really could have agency on his own, but because of everything that he's gone through and because these books are so like status quo focused, he will he will never do that. And that will never be an experience that he has. And I think that that's the point. It's not even everything that he's gone through because everything that he has gone through actually sets up perfectly for an arc to realize that, oh my God, all I ever needed to do was believe in myself Mm -hmm. If I believed in myself, what the fuck am I capable of? And then discovering something outside of being second best to anybody else. But again, it is that status quo. It is that it is that reason of, oh, we're going to treat children so that this is where they are and they're stagnant. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that's, that's pretty much the problem that we find throughout this entire series. And again, this kind of draws into the seventh and the finishing of the series. But that's basically the problem. The whole thing Mm -hmm. is that these characters, even though they've gone through so much, have not changed a bit. Yes. Like yes. in the grand scheme of things, their positions is where they were at the beginning of the novels and at the end of the series. Same position, just seven years older and with more agency because they're adults, but really not. Not really, because they're still just <laughs> playing their roles within the system. Like yeah. um, like Tom is is a, a a bully, you know, um magical supremacist, I guess you could call it, as a child. And as an adult, he's a bully magical supremacist. Harry is as a child is a is a put upon um, you know, jock kid. And as an adult, he's a he's a put upon jock kid. You know, he becomes a cop, right? Ron yep. is um, um is a is looked over and has like no uh no agency in his own life 
as an adult, he's uh, looked over and has no agency in his own life. Um, Hermione is like a, a, a bratty know-it-all that just can't stand to have anyone order her around. And as an adult, she's the same. She's a bratty know-it-all that can't stand to have anyone order her around. Ginny is the same way as well, is 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 in love with Harry Potter and uh, will do anything and sacrifice anything to be with him. At the end of the day, she ends up marrying the bloke who doesn't treat him her well. Mm -hmm. uh, Luna is the oddball who will always be an oddball. They fit, they start where they finish. And mm -hmm. it's it, that is obviously a flaw within the books and the writing and the like understanding of character arc but i'm gonna argue that we see change in our adults we see change in severus snape from where he was from the beginning to the end we see change in um some of the like in in molly weasley i think she grows a ton i think even in the small span in which we see remus he grows a ton mm -hmm. um and we're seeing change in our adults that we're not seeing in our kids and that's missing the point of ya uh, so again, it's like this thing of, sure, the Harry Potter series expanded this trope and this culture and this genre, uh, but it really missed the mark of what the genre was supposed to be, or at least where it turned into. Well, if you think about other other favorite YA, so I'm going to go on go on for a second about um, my favorite oh, YA, Animorphs, and it has the kids going through fighting a war, just like in Harry Potter. Only it's it's set up different. The stakes are higher. It's way better in regards to the way it writes that element. And the kids all go through changes. Like, I don't want to give too many spoilers because it's an excellent series. And I highly recommend that you read it on your own or at least read a summary. Um, because this was during the Scholastic Book Fair time of, of YA. And so there's a lot of filler content in that series. But um, but the kids go through drastic changes um, some of the, I mean, they, they literally go through a war. So not a single one of them comes out the same. And, um, and if you think about the main characters in that, uh, in that, uh, there are definitely ones that, that don't survive. And I don't mean in the way that it happens in Harry Potter, where we lose one of the twins and we lose Hedwig. Um, those are definitely like side side characters. Uh, I can tell you, that's not what happens in Animorphs. Um, if you think about the characters we lose, it's not like side side characters that really are not necessary to anything anyway. Um, <laughs> you know, so, uh, it's, it's very, it's very different. And I just, this, this is where we start to get into the things that frustrate me a little bit about Harry Potter. And it really starts in this book. Um, and this, the way that the children are treated, I think is a good example of like there's just so much love for the status quo that you even see in the main characters they're not allowed to have like arcs that actually affect their personalities they they can only have arcs in the way that the series um puts trauma upon them right but that trauma is not allowed to change them and those things that they overcome are not allowed to change them the one character um that goes through the most out of the kids is hermione and it's been argued it, that um she is J.K. Rowling's self-insert, right? So if you think, if that's true and you think about that, she's one of the few characters that actually does have her mind changed on some things and does kind of grow and mature emotionally. Like she does, I guess say that she ends up as like a, a brat that no one wants to tell her, no one, she doesn't want to hear what anyone tells her what to do as an adult. But she does like not, she is not as bad as she gets older than she is in the earlier books, um, as far as some of that know-it-all behavior goes, right? But I can't say that's true for any of the others. Like even though I would say Hermione keeps her traits, um, they, they do lessen and they do soften and she does learn emotional maturity in a way that the other characters really don't. I think also because her, Hermione was never written as a kid. That's true. She's kind of not. She's kind of pretty mature from the beginning. She's an adult. She's an adult from the beginning. Like yeah. there, there are times where it's almost like infantilizing some of the other characters. Hermione isn't. Mm -hmm. Hermione knows exactly what's down. She knows how to process things. She's all the idea of it's it's all logic. Her priorities are very childish. But the way that she acts is not teenage girl. That's true. Rarely is teenage girl. That's true. That's true. 
But there is one of the other child characters yeah. in Harry Potter that we need to talk about. And um, and so for this book, uh, we have been kind of gearing up for this, and I've been promising this to Landon for some time. We, we would like to now talk about Landon's favorite is favorite of all the favorites, Draco Malfoy. <laughs> I think that what we really see with Draco Malfoy, sorry, I had a perfect transition, is that talk about a character who isn't allowed to change. And this is where we see JKR really dig her heels into this. Because we have a whole fucking arc for this character. And out of character, out of canon, talking to interviewers, talking on Twitter, JKR is basically saying that Draco Malfoy, if you like Draco Malfoy, then you're a terrible person. Uh, Because the idea and concept that Draco Malfoy can change from who he was at 11 years old throughout a series of Book of Seven and living through a war is unfathomable to J.K. Rowling. Uh, And it's just, it's like that perfect example of just sitting there and being like, no, this this character is incredibly depth-filled. If you just let him be. <laughs> I remember those interviews. I remember those interviews. Because she she would talk about Draco that way. And she would talk about Snape that way. But if you look at how they're written, it's kind of like, like Draco is supposed to be the, the young Snape, right? Mm-hmm. In the books. And they they do eventually get a sort of redemption. But not one that we actively see much of. Like there is more of it in the final book in regards to Draco. But in this book, we spend the entire book with Harry just being obsessed about what is this evil thing that Draco is doing. And then he turns out that he was right, that Draco really is trying to become a young Death Eater. And he thinks that if he does this, excuse me, this terrible task, that all of a sudden he's going to be taking the dark mark and he's going to be in his right spot where he wants to be. And we get these little like glimpses, like we get these little glimpses where um, Narcissa goes and tries to get Severus to protect Draco because she doesn't want him becoming a Death Eater. But what we see from Draco's perspective is that, nah, he wants this. Like he really wants this. And we it, it's one of the things where we're kind of limited by the structure of this book, right? Like we're limited by seeing only Harry's perspective. Yeah. I would love to read a Draco perspective version of the Half Blood Prince. Wouldn't that be amazing? Yeah. J.K. Rowling's not allowed to write it though. <laughs> no, no, she can't write. Uh, but you know how like um how like uh, Stephanie Meyer went back and wrote like the um the Ed version of the Twilight books, and it turns out like oh. He's even more awful than we thought. Like I, I just, I would love, to, I would love to see like Draco's perspective there. I think it would be incredibly interesting. I would love to see it if it was written proper, if it was telling the story that it actually told, and wasn't telling the story of what J.K. Rowling wishes it was being told. So, so let me ask you this, Landon, because Draco is your favoriteest favorite that were to ever yeah. favorite, and you have just kind of also, you was like put out there very problematic. Because super, oh yeah, super problematic. <laughs> um, <laughs> if we knew Draco in real life, we would not stand, right? Would not. Would <laughs> punch him. Would pull Hermione and punch him in the face. Yeah. So, but um, tell us. I would love to hear yeah. from you, like why why draco what draws you to this character because it's not just you like draco has a huge fandom so so what is it about the malfoy boy so well first of all (laughs) he's blonde um no i think that the 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 arc in total i think that there are several things that really um makes draco stand out one of them being drawing to the like stand out as far as like within media and fandom but also with me uh, also like the the attraction and attachment to the idea of the bad boy definitely exists in there existed in my youth existed with fandom that's why a lot of people like him 
Um, but once you start digging in closer to the character, I think the thing that made me really realize that I liked Draco is because the story of redemption is written so clearly there. And I think for a lot of people who felt that idea of irredeemable or, or felt that way, all of a sudden having it being presented on a page in which there is a path of redemption, as if there is a way of like, oh, you could be this terrible, mean, bigoted person and grow from there and change your mind, whether it be exactly aligned with how Draco did, which is actual literal racism and uh, elitism and all of that, to just being like, you know, a self-hating teenage girl. Uh, it, it's the same roadmap, if that makes sense. So I think that that also allowed for a lot of perspective where we're talking from the idea of Hermione, who's never done anything wrong in her life, and Ron, who's never done anything wrong in his life, uh, and Harry, who is literally the golden child boy within this character and has done nothing wrong in his life. Well, nothing uh, that the he, books would seem wrong. I disagree on him, but the narrative nothing, doesn't punish him for nothing anything he does that wrong. He considers he did wrong because remember, mm -hmm. as teenagers, we're reading from his perspective. <laughs> um, once you dive deeper, you're like, wow, all of them are incredibly flawed characters, and it's in, 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 interesting that the bad person is considered, you know, bad. Anyway, um, I, I think that there is a lot of interest there. I also think because of how it's written and how protective JKR is over Harry, there isn't room for growth. We don't see Harry grow. You, that, so like automatically it feels like there is a wall around this character that you can't necessarily project onto because we know so much about this character and everything like that. But with, Jake, with uh, Draco, it's like a half filled in application that you can put things in here or there that you really like, that you can weave together your own story to make sense. And I think that's another reason why fandom loves him uh, is because he's half filled out much more than like NPCs, which are on the fringe. We understand who Draco is, but we can fill in the backstory and the reasoning and all of that. Lady loves Draco too. <laughs> I should love Draco. So, so I think, I think that that's, those are all like excellent points, right? So if I think about it from my perspective as somebody that wasn't like super incredibly drawn to, um, to Draco in the books, I think about, um, the idea of redemption. And I think because his redemption arc was not super satisfying is maybe why I was not quite as interested in Draco as maybe some other people were. Um, cause I think about other media where we do have a character that is incredibly problematic in one way or another. And they do go through actual growth and change their mind and realize like, oh, you know, bigotry is wrong. So I think an excellent example of this is uh, is Peacemaker. So if you have not seen the newest Suicide Squad, James, James Gunn's version of Suicide Squad, then you might not know this, but the Peacemaker character in there is kind of this like American exceptionalism, um, you know, elevated to like a comical level right and then there's a follow-up tv show that has him as the star where basically the character goes through this arc where he learns that you know maybe like the parts of me that are that are racist and bigoted and um and devaluing other humans are wrong and maybe i should look for other reasons to do the things that I do. And maybe that means some of my behaviors need to stop or change. And he really goes through it. So by the way, if you like this type of character, I highly, highly recommend watching Peacemaker. I can't talk, I can't say anything about the blondness, but as far as like the character that is really a, a, a bad boy, um, you know, incredibly problematic, going through a redemption, that one's a really good example of like, his soul really does change. Like Peacemaker's soul really does change. And I I feel like fandom version of Draco Malfoy is that. <laughs> and that and that's the thing, is that it's it, specifically it is fandom version of Draco Malfoy. The book version of Draco Malfoy, like legit, I was 12 and he was blonde and had daddy issues. <laughs> so let me let me ask you this, because a lot a lot of uh, people that are not as into Draco have this criticism 
of um, of Draco Malfoy lovers is they will say things like, you just love Tom Felton. So no. what are your thoughts on that? It, how much does Tom Felton play into this? Uh, it didn't for, I love Draco before that, um, before Tom was even casted or there was movies. Like I, like I remember him just being on screen and I was not even on screen, but like reading the book and I was just like, that's, I'm in Slytherin. That's my dude. That's who I fuck with. Uh, <laughs> again, I was the same age as these characters when we were reading them. I was, I was 10, 11 when I first read about Draco. So, um, yeah, I think that sure you can sit there and say Tom is the reason why people like him. And I'm sure there, that is a reason why people like him. Um, but I also don't think that that's fair because like Daniel Radcliffe's not the reason like you like Harry Potter or I would assume I would assume for for people that really love Harry Harry as a character that that would be true that Daniel Radcliffe would only enhance the experience he would not be the yes, reason exactly or Hermione Granger and Emma Watson um because god I love Emma Watson and also Hermione two separate facts yeah <laughs> um no and I think so I get why people don't get Draco I do because I think that they haven't dived into the complexity of his story. Um, I the thing about Draco's story is it's the same as Harry's. Harry's and Draco's stories are incredibly similar if you line them out. They're like we were saying, Tom Riddle and Harry are two sides of the same coin. Uh, Draco and Harry are two sides of the same coin. Um, whereas they are very different in some ways. Obviously, Draco was raised with uh, a family that. Uh, adored him on the outside supposedly uh, but also the expectations put upon him were as harmful and can be as harmful as the abuse that Harry suffered. Mm -hmm. um, I think the and glimpses that we get in into Draco's home life uh, kind of hint at the same way that like we can say you know Dudley was abused too right I think we get yeah. enough hints to say like Draco was abused too not in the way that Harry was abused but in more like the way Dudley was abused. Yeah, and I think that there's that level of like, oh, you really have to, if you're going to have empathy for Harry, you also need to have empathy for Dudley. Uh, and if you're going to have empathy for Harry, you also need to have empathy for Draco that at this point in time, especially in this book, Draco was 16 year old, who, a 16 year old whose parents' life was in his hands. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, he's going to be like, yeah, joining this cult thing is so cool. But also, as soon as he realizes that he is not infallible, as soon as he realizes that failure is more likely a possibility than anything else, as soon as he starts grappling with the idea that he has to murder someone in order to save his parents, we do start seeing the deterioration of that. We mm -hmm. do start seeing Draco Malfoy start to crack under the pressure and realizing that his mother specifically is being tortured and stuck inside of a house with a madman who's killing people with a snake and that he's 16 years old and all of a sudden he has to then save his parents lives the parents that are supposed to be protecting him and also the parents that got him in on this because if his dad hadn't if his dad hadn't become a death eater draco wouldn't have to do this yeah, um, true. So he has to pick up his parents' mess in the same way that Harry has to pick up the war of a generation before him. Mm -hmm. um, and it is it is an incredibly complex, it, it's the shell of a complex character that J.K. Rowling didn't write, but fandom did. And I think that that's the thing that that people who really love Draco love about him is that like, oh no, he had to also take on the world, but in a very different way. Mm -hmm. And he could not go out and fight a war firsthand, but he had to live with it and hold down the fort. And I think a lot more people can relate to having to live with the evil in your life and hold down the fort than to fight it on their own. Yeah, uh, I would say, I oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say, and I think that that's why a lot of people connect to Draco because mm -hmm. of that fight. That's how most people fight. Yeah, no, I would agree. Like, I was never a huge, like, Draco Malfoy fan, but I will say that my experience of reading the character, that's what I identified in him is like, oh, you're the kid with, because I grew up in the Southeast, Eastern US, okay? So, like, you're the kid 
who has the evangelical parents. And so you're evangelical too, even though in the back of your mind, you kind of wonder if this is really what you should be doing or not. Right. And that's how I see Draco. And that's kind of, that's kind of how his character has always come off to me. He's, he's the child of the evangelical parents that wonders whether this is right or not right. And at least based on my experience, it typically takes till minimum age 16 or so for anyone to be able to kind of break out of that and really have their own thoughts. There's something about getting a car and being able to drive and go where you want to go that tends to make kids like totally change um, and break away from their parents in, in those regards. And it's so that's also, kind of I mean, how I always saw Draco. There's also like a psychological idea of, of maturity of understanding, hey, you are officially like having the agency to break the rules that your parents engage with and you get to start making and have the context to make decisions on your own. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what we start seeing here too. Um, the Draco Malfoy, I mean, I think it's also a joke. Anyone who sits there and is, is like, oh, he chose to be a Death Eater. I'm like, the man was living in his house. The man was like, even Sirius Black didn't have Voldemort living in his house. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. <laughs> he was living in his house. Draco had nowhere else to go. Yeah. He was going to say, no, I'm not going to become a Death Eater. What the heck? Right. Like, and what was he going to, what was he going to do? Move in with his little like um, implied girlfriend? What the heck's her name? I can't remember. Um, yeah. But was he going to move in with Pansy? Was he going to move in with, with Blaze Zabini? You know, like these, these kids were all magical supremacists too. Like. There was no escaping it. He had no, he had no like friend to go to. He had no Weasleys, right? That he could just like go and crash at their house if things got really, truly terrible, right? He didn't have that. So I don't think, I don't see him as a character that has, that has a choice in this book um, to not become a Death Eater, right? Or in any, yeah, or in any, I don't think at this point in any book, because we're still seeing the child version of him. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. I also think that it's incredibly important to recognize that um, Draco is heavily queer coded in some aspects as far as not nearly as much as Remus Lupin was, um, but the idea of, of feeling the, the failure and disappointment in existing and being who he is. Um, there is a lot of like struggling with the internalized like I have this thing that I can't tell anybody about mm -hmm. um where where is that maybe that's not queer coding but there's a lot of there's a lot of like connections that a lot of queer people can connect to mm -hmm. with him and the journey that he goes through specifically in this book uh and obviously his ends up being that a bunch of death eaters come out of a closet and try to kill a man and whereas right. most <laughs> teenagers at his age was just coming out of the closet part um, but it is that idea of like, it's real. there are some characters that are really easy to project onto. Mm -hmm. And I think Draco is one of those characters. Now, obviously not everybody in the Draco Malfoy fandom feels that way. Dramini is a huge, huge ship, um, that a lot of people support, but I think that that is, that does play a role in why he is incredibly popular amongst queer kids. Yeah. Um, because there are those things that are easy to project on or easy to feel empathy and connect to. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, for sure. I think I don't, I don't necessarily see Draco as a queer coded character because yeah. I was definitely not on the dreary train quite as much, which is, um, I know interesting for me since I'm, I typically am like the, you know, the Fujoshi, right. But I was not like super into, into dreary. So I didn't really see that, but I definitely see him coded in the same way that like a lot of queer people will identify with um, with Disney protagonists, right? You know, like uh, Ariel from The Little Mermaid is a really good example where a lot of queer people will identify with this idea of like, gosh, the world that I live in is so limiting. I wish I could change that. I wish I could change my body. I wish I could change my soul. I wish I could, you know, those sorts of things. And I definitely see Draco is that type of character for sure. So while I don't see him as queer coded, I definitely see exactly what what 
um, queer people can identify with in Draco the same way that I see like Disney protagonists, like yeah, not queer could. coded, but obviously queer people would like them. Right. Yes. No, it is. It is that idea of uh, he is an easy vessel to project onto versus yes. actually written purposely as, as coded. And that is, yes. yes, that was my mistake for using queer coded in that way. But it is that it is that easy vessel because I guarantee you, if you ask a lot of queer kids like who are Harry Potter fans, a lot of them will link queerness with Draco Malfoy yeah Um, and and yeah it's just an it's an interesting part of it Uh, Mm -hmm. and I think it's also an interesting part as to knowing that and maybe JKR doesn't so maybe I'm digging too much into it knowing that but JKR also having hostility for people who do support Draco and yeah, his- she seems to have hostility for anyone who supports her villains because she was like that towards some people that Except like Snape me. too. No, no, she no, she was though. Uh, she was hostile. Cha- her tune, her tune has changed specifically. Oh, I know. Uh, but like it, it hasn't with Draco at least, where it's been consistently like if you like Draco Malfoy. Which is so interesting because we have this section on Draco. So I just, yeah, which is so interesting because we have this section on Draco, right? So before we end today, I want to acknowledge um, something about Tom Felton. He is one of the few Harry Potter actors that has not to this day condemned J.K. Rowling's transphobia, nor has he come out to say that he explicitly supports trans people. So we're, we're, we're showering a lot of love on Draco. Um, We do love Tom Felton's portrayal of Draco, but I just want to make sure if you're not aware of that, um, watching this, that you are now, you you now know he's one of the few that has, uh, that has not where, which is interesting because basically the rest of the cast of both the Harry Potter um, series and the Fantastic Beasts series have come out in one way or another to say J.K. Rowling's full of shit and I disagree, (laughs) but he has not. He has not, and no, and Tom is, it's its very interesting, Tom is, yeah. how he's living his life. Uh, he is definitely the one that is like, I am never getting another acting job again uh, that is not related to Draco Malfoy, therefore I'm going to try to stay on the good side of fans as much as possible mm-hmm. uh, and ride this wave until I'm retired. Yeah, um, <laughs> I mean, he was briefly, and I think it was The Flash, it was one of those CW yeah, he played, shows, he and he played Draco, Draco Malfoy. Malfoy. Yeah, he was just Draco Malfoy, Draco Malfoy in the Flash. <laughs> Literally. Same character. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. And the, with the same arc. Uh, yeah, it was it was interesting. Um, and so, no, Tom, Tom Felton can fuck off. Uh, but his portrayal of Draco Malfoy is a good one. And also Draco Malfoy the character. I just would encourage everyone before you write him off to give a little think about this character because <laughs> he is incredible truly incredible uh in he or he can be and fandom has made him that way Mm -hmm. definitely enjoy thick version of draco i would say definitely there's a there's a reason like it's not even the draco harry sort of dynamic but there is a reason why drary is one of my favorite fan fiction things to read and it's because fandom just has such a good way with making both these half-written characters interesting (laughs) yes (laughs) for sure all right, you guys. So that that's our part one of Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince. Um, if we could, yeah, go to the next slide. So next week, we will be covering part two of Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince. Uh, we talked a lot about the, the children and the way that they related to the adults in this. So we're going to kind of take it the other way around next week. We're going to talk about the adults and how they relate to the world at large and how they relate to the child characters of Harry Potter. So if you are interested in that, like basically, if we didn't talk about your pet favorite topic from the Half-Blood Prince, it's probably coming up next week. So tune in. We'll see you then um, to talk about that. Uh, Also, on Thursday... Oh, oh, sorry, go ahead. I just have to compliment you. Yes. Fantastic title. Fantastic oh, title. Thank Harry you. Potter and the Half Blood Bullshit is truly <laughs> a swear word that I am going to take in and just uh, use from now on. Instead of just saying bullshit, I'm going to say that's Harry Potter and the Half Blood Bullshit. Mm-hmm. Uh, thank you. So much. <laughs>
<laughs> because spoilers, this book is full of it. Oh my God. <laughs> Yes. Okay. So we're going to talk about that next week. So please be sure to tune in for that. Also, it's not on the slide here, but the week after that, we're going to be having our community day and we're going to be doing Among Us, which we haven't done in a long time. There's been a lot of changes and updates to the game. Um, if you would like to play Among Us with us, then I would encourage you to join our Discord server. So joining the cafe is great because you can hang out with us, but also because we can control the pings in there. So if you want to make sure you always know what's going on ahead of time, you want to make sure that you're invited to the stuff, you want to make sure you know when we go live, then you want to get in that Discord. That is also where I will be posting more information about that next um, community day. So it's going to be Among Us. We're going to have some fun. It's going to be awesome. Are you excited, Landon? I know you're excited I'm, for Among Us. Listen, I know <laughs> for those of you who haven't been around for a little while, um, my favorite thing to do is lie and kill my friends. So Among Us is the perfect game. Uh, I am forever the werewolf games, the like, you know, the mafia games, the mm -hmm. Among Us games, favorite games. And the fact that we're playing it again and it was Karen's idea makes me so happy. <laughs> yeah, I decided it was time. So I am I am not I am very bad at Among Us. I don't enjoy lying. I don't enjoy deceiving. Um, I'm a very truthful person. And so Among Us, I have to put in a lot of effort to be good at that game. So, <laughs> But it, there have been a lot of updates and I do want to experience the new updates with you guys. So we're going to play it. My, my whole thing is like, I'm like, I'm acting. I, it's You don't get to act very often as an adult. True. And I feel like in games where you're like, oh no, I didn't kill anybody. Uh, and that makes you also quickly think on your feet. That's my shit. There's a reason why I play D&D. &D. There's a reason why I love Among Us. This is why. <laughs> Yep. Um, also, I stream on Thursday. So that is Artistic License. I stream that by myself. And we are playing Final Fantasy X right now. We are in the end game of Final Fantasy X. So if you would like to come join me for that, that is on Thursday from 630 to 830 Eastern. Um, also, You can find me in all of these places. So if you would like to watch VODs of any of our episodes, like if you would like to go back and watch the other Harry Potter episodes we have done, which I highly recommend, go check out my YouTube channel. They are all uploaded there. My main social media is Twitter. You can always find the latest updates on what's going on in Twitter. So you can check there. Um, and of course, my Discord is, is linked once again. So that's all the places that you can find me. Landon, where can everybody find you? You can find me on Instagram at Land in Maine. Summer's about to start, bitches. I'm about to be out of school. So the summer adventures, which will consist of mostly sleeping and cleaning, will begin and they will be documented on Instagram in case you want to know what's going on in my life. Yes. Um, <laughs> so much fun. <laughs> Finally going to adult. Um, mm -hmm. And you can also find, find me on Twitter where I mostly am just a Karen Terry stan. Uh, but also... And talking about things like D D on there too. So that's what I've got for you. All right. Awesome. All right, you guys. So um I think for today we're gonna raid into my um favorite kitten cam streamer because none of my friends are online, you guys. None of my friends are online. So we're gonna raid into the kitten clubhouse, I think. It's it's cute. Y'all should follow it. It's really, really good background kitten watching. So that's what we're gonna raid into. There we go. Um, all right, you guys. So thank you guys so much for joining us today. Really appreciate you coming and hanging out with us. See you next week for more Harry Potter bullshit. And of course, as always, don't forget to make it a great day. Don't forget to be awesome. All right. Bye, guys. Have fun bye. watching the kittens. <laughs>